The kinetics and thermodynamics of photo-induced electron transfer are the subjects of this video. And so what we're going to do is develop a relatively detailed kinetic model or mechanistic model for PET processes, taking the quenching step of the Stern-Volmer mechanistic picture and really bringing it into sharper focus with some more detailed elementary steps. And then we'll talk a little bit about the thermodynamics and how we do a redox analysis for a photo-induced electron transfer process. This actually is not that different from analysis of a redox reaction that you may have done in your general chemistry course. We just layer on the photo excitation energy and a coulombic term associated with electron transfers happening in solution. We'll see how all that works in the second half of this video. This slide lists a kinetic or a mechanistic model for photo-induced electron transfer processes. And as crazy as it looks, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that this is nothing more than the Stern-Volmer mechanistic model that we developed previously with the quenching step broken up into five distinct steps where we are restricting ourselves to an electron transfer process possibly involving an exaplex or a diffusional encounter complex, we might say. So we start with our excited state. I've actually left absorption off of this picture. That excited state can undergo radiative decay, fluorescence or phosphorescence to the ground state. It can undergo non-radiative decay where M star becomes M with the release of heat. It can engage in a diffusional encounter with a quencher forming an exaplex. That exaplex can separate back into the excited state and Q. This is the reverse of the diffusional encounter step. The exaplex can engage in reaction. Here it's electron transfer. And here we're restricting ourselves to an oxidative quenching process, but all of this applies equally well to a reductive quenching process. The only thing that changes is whether we're dealing with a radical cation or radical anion of the excited molecule M. Reverse reaction is the reverse of this step, reforming the neutral exaplex from the radical ion pair. And product separation is important. So M dot plus and Q dot minus inside brackets indicates a radical ion pair in which the ions are strongly interacting with each other and are relatively close in space. Separation of those ions takes some energy because there's Coulombic attraction here. And so we're going to add that as a step into our model as well. The rates for each of these processes are listed here, and these are what we would expect based on simple kinetic considerations of each of the individual elementary steps. We've seen Km for emission, Ki for non-radiative decay processes, Kd now we're using to refer to the rate constant for diffusional encounter, with K negative D the reverse rate constant for separation, and Kr and K negative R refer to forward and reverse reaction respectively, with Ks referring to product separation. I won't go through the details here, but I can refer you to a reference in the video description where the details are laid out in all of their goriness. We'll just state here that the general result for rate constant of quenching overall is that it is equal to the product of that diffusional rate constant, the forward reaction rate constant, and the product separation rate constant divided by sums of some pairwise terms for the reverse and forward processes. So K negative D times K negative R plus K negative D times KS for product separation plus KR times KS for reaction and product separation. And there are two kinetic regimes that pop out of this equation depending on the relative rates of reaction and diffusion. Case one is the situation when the rate of reaction is much slower than the rate of diffusion. In the language of rate constants here, we're saying that Kr is much, much less than Kd, the rate constant for diffusion. Under those circumstances, the terms containing Kr in the denominator can drop out because Kr is much smaller than Kd. And two dominant terms remain when we do this. Kd, Kr, Ks, of course, in the numerator remains. And in the denominator, the most important term becomes Ks k negative d, since the rate constant for reverse diffusion is also going to be much larger than the rate constant for reverse reaction. When we drop out these other terms, we end up with the equation you see here. The rate constant of quenching is approximately equal to kd times kr divided by k negative d. Notice that the rate constant for product separation divides out here as well. The rate constant of diffusion will encounter divided by the rate constant for separation of the exaplex is an equilibrium constant for diffusional encounter, big Kd. And so another way to write this is big Kd times the rate constant of reaction, Kr. And the simple idea at the root of what we call activation control is that the rate constant of quenching is proportional 
to the rate constant of reaction. Fairly simple result. The equilibrium constant for diffusional encounter also matters, and this depends on the stability of the exaplex relative to the separated m star and q. That's actually worth reminding ourselves of by explicitly writing out what this equilibrium constant is going to look like. It is the molarity of the exaplex as the product of diffusional encounter, quote unquote, divided by the molarities of the separated m star and q at equilibrium. So here the quenching rate is controlled by the stability of the exaplex as well as the rate of reaction, which makes intuitive sense since the rate of reaction is much slower than the rate of diffusion. And so there are many diffusional encounters that do not lead to reaction in this regime. In case two, the reaction rate becomes much faster than the rate of diffusion. And so now we essentially flip the inequality with Kr much greater than the rate constant of diffusion. Intuitively, this means that every single diffusional encounter results in a reaction taking place, since diffusion is now the rate-limiting step. This is why this is called diffusional or diffusion control. In this situation, we deal with this kq equation in a somewhat different way, treating kd as much, much smaller than kr. This allows us to ignore any terms that contain kd or k negative d, which includes this first term right here, and this term here in the denominator, the dominant term in that denominator is clearly going to be kr times ks, since we've stipulated that kr is much, much greater than kd and k negative d. And so the simple result that we arrive at here, which should make intuitive sense, is that kq is approximately equal to kd. The rate constant of quenching is roughly equal to the rate constant of diffusion. In the diffusional control situation, the rate of quenching is controlled solely by the rate of diffusion, how often m star and q come into contact with one another. And of course, here we've focused on electron transfer as the reaction process, but it's worth noting that this analysis can also be applied to any photochemical reaction. We can identify two limiting situations. Either the reaction is slower than diffusion, case one, in which case the activation energy of the rea reaction really controls the rate of quenching, or the reaction is faster than diffusion, in which case it's the rate of diffusion that controls the rate of quenching. Toward the end of this video, we'll see this play out in practice when we look at the rate constants of various electron transfer processes as a function of their thermodynamic delta G. But first, we need to deal with calculating or thinking through that thermodynamic delta G. Like all redox reactions, photoinduced electron transfer can be envisioned as two half reactions, an oxidation process and a reduction process. And we can use redox potentials to get a sense of the free energy change associated with any photoinduced electron transfer process. The wrinkle with PET is that we have to incorporate the excitation energy of the excited state as well. And so this is slightly different for oxidative and reductive quenching. And so we'll look at equations for the two cases. They're going to be highly analogous to one another. Let's begin with oxidative quenching, in which the excited state serves as an electron donor and the ground state A as electron acceptor. We can break this up into oxidation and reduction half reactions. The excited state D star donates an electron to A and therefore undergoes oxidation. It loses an electron to form the radical cation D dot plus. This is an oxidation process. At the same time, a undergoes a completely ground state reduction process, gaining an electron to form the radical anion A dot minus. This reduction process of A to A dot minus is associated with a reduction potential, E naught, for A and its radical anion. That is a contributor to the free energy change of this PET process. The oxidation process is a little bit more complicated because it's not the ground state of D that's undergoing oxidation. It is the excited state. However, if we think about how we made D star in the first place, we'll realize that D star was made through photo excitation of D. That's what makes this a photo-induced electron transfer process. And the energy input associated with this is the excitation energy associated with the excited state D star, which we're going to denote as E star D. And so we can think of the overall oxidation of D to D dot plus as happening via the intermediacy of the excited state D star. Temporarily ignoring that we go through D star, we can realize that 
this oxidation potential makes a contribution to the overall free energy change of the PET process. And notice here that E naught D dot plus D is the reduction potential of D's radical cation. Since D is undergoing an oxidation process, the reverse process, a negative sign appears here in front of that reduction potential. Finally, we need to take into account the fact that D is photoexcited to D star. Light provides a driving force for this electron transfer process, and so the excitation energy associated with D star is added as a negative term, since that is going to decrease or make more negative the free energy change of the PET process. And these values highlighted in red, blue, and green are generally the three things we need to know to do a redox analysis of a PET process. The excitation energy associated with D star relative to the ground state of D, the reduction potential associated with the electron acceptor, and the reduction potential associated with the radical cation of the donor, or equivalently, the oxidation potential of the neutral donor molecule. These potentials are multiplied by this factor F, which is Faraday's constant. Essentially, for our purposes, a conversion factor from electrical potential, which is typically expressed in volts, to an energy value, which may be expressed in electron volts, kilocalories per mole, or kilojoules per mole. Very commonly, these excitation energies are expressed in kilojoules or kilocalories per mole directly. Let's work relatively quickly now through the reductive quenching case, where all that's happened is the electron donor and electron acceptor have switched roles. Now the electron acceptor is in an excited state. We can still break this down into oxidation and reduction half reactions. First, let's focus on what happens to the excited state. A star gains an electron. Now, this is a reduction process to form the ground state radical cation A dot minus. The electron donor, which is now fully in its ground state, loses an electron to form the corresponding radical cation D dot plus, and of course, this is an oxidation process. And the photo-induced aspect of this involves photoexcitation of the electron acceptor through absorption of a photon, and that's associated with this energy E star A, now the excitation energy associated with exciting from A to A star. Just as before, we have three terms that are either potential or energy terms in this calculation of delta G for the overall process. The simplest to understand is the oxidation potential of D, or equivalently the reduction potential of the radical cation that appears here as this negative E naught D dot star D term minus the reduction potential of D dot star. And as we did for the case above, temporarily ignoring that we go through A star, we can notice that the overall process here is the reduction of A to A dot minus, which is why the reduction potential of A to form A dot minus appears in this equation. And to account for the fact that A is imbued with energy through photo excitation, we add the excitation energy of A to A dot star as a negative term here. Now, this all looks well and good, and in fact, compared to what you did in general chemistry in the unit on electrochemistry, this is no different than that, with the exception of these terms underlined in green, which just provide an energy boost for the electron transfer process. But there is one wrinkle that we haven't talked about yet, and in fact, it's often ignored in simple treatments of redox reactions. We've gone from neutral reactants to charged products in both cases. And the charges are opposite, and so there is attraction of those charged particles to one another, and this can provide a driving force for electron transfer, since that attraction is missing from the reactant side. It's a coulombic attraction term that we can add in as a negative term onto these first three terms to get a more accurate picture of the free energy change. So let's work quickly through this coulombic attraction term. On the product side, we have a radical cation, let's call it D dot plus, and let's represent it simply as a sphere to keep things simple, and we have a radical anion, A dot minus, derived from the electron acceptor. These are separated from one another at some distance. We're going to call that distance R, the separation between the centers of the radical cation and anion, and there is coulombic attraction associated with the charges and the separation distance between the cation and anion. To calculate the energy associated with that attraction, all we need to do is a relatively simple application of Coulomb's law. 
So first of all, that energy will be negative because this is a stabilizing attractive interaction and it is going to involve an inverse dependence on the distance between the radical cation and anion R and a direct dependence on the product of the charges. And so if we're talking plus one and minus one in units of the elementary charge, the overall result here will be E squared, where E is the elementary charge. And if we want that energy in units of, say, kilocalories per mole, we need to multiply by Avogadro's number. An equivalent way to think about this is as Faraday's constant times the elementary charge. In the denominator, we have a few additional factors that account for permittivity. So we have 4 pi times the permittivity of free space and a factor representing the permittivity of the solvent, which matters profoundly and which we should actually add into our model. The per relative permittivity of the solvent, how much electric fields are attenuated in sol inside the solvent, matters profoundly here. In the older literature, you'll hear this called the dielectric constant of the solvent. And so if we want to, for a given radical cation and anion pair, we could calculate the coulombic energy associated with existing in a particular solvent. Qualitatively, though, it's important to understand what this equation is saying. And in particular, we're interested in situations where the coulombic energy is relatively negative or relatively positive. What we can conclude from this equation is that the coulombic energy is more negative, in other words, this Coulombic interaction is more stabilizing when we are dealing with a nonpolar solvent. Nonpolar solvents are associated with relatively low values for their relative permittivity. This results in a relatively negative Coulombic energy term, since that appears in the denominator of this expression on the right hand side. And the second thing we can conclude relates to R, the distance between the ions or their relative size. The smaller the ions are, the more negative is the Coulombic energy term. And we can again see that from the form of this equation. So the Coulombic energy becomes more important as we move to relatively small ions and relatively nonpolar solvents. And that's an important intuition to have. It allows us, for example, to think about how we can rationally adjust the solvent to encourage a, a photo-induced electron transfer process to take place. The more nonpolar the solvent, the more negative this contribution, and perhaps the more negative is the overall free energy change of the electron transfer process.